And so with that, I'm going to introduce Dr. Shelley Hamel. She works as an extension agent with the University of Hawaii Sea Grant College Program and serves as the Coastal Lands Program Coordinator with the Department of Land and Natural Resources Office of Conservation and Coastal Lands. Shelley provides scientific policy and program coordination support on issues regarding coastal geomorphic processes, coastal hazards, beach conservation, and restoration, appropriate coastal land use and environment, uh, environmental document and regulation permit review. Oh, that's a mouthful. She also works closely with the University of Hawaii Coastal Geology Group simulating future flooding for sea level rise related components, considering groundwater inundation, storm drain failure, and direct marine flooding by sea level rise and high tides in the Honolulu area. And after that, we'll have Dr. Tristan McKenzie, who is a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Earth Sciences and works with Hawaii EPSCOR Ikebai Project and the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Similar to Dr. Hebel, Trista completed her, or her their PhD in geology and geophysics at UHM uh, with an emphasis on groundwater contamination and coastal hydrology. Trista's current research focuses on the use of machine learning with field-based observations, submarine groundwater discharge to study factors influencing water resources today and in the future. Trista's research interests include groundwater contamination, coastal hydrology, uh, aqueous chemistry, application of data-driven technologies to field observations, and climate change impacts on water quality. Uh, please join me in welcoming our speakers today, and I'll let Dr. Shelley Hable kick it off. Um, aloha, Th thank you for inviting us to the seminar, and uh, we're really honored by your interest in our work um, today we'll go over impacts of sea level rise on on-site sewage disposal systems owing to both erosion and groundwater inundation of those systems. But I'll just go over it to provide some context. So among the islands, groundwater mainly exists as part of a freshwater lens aquifer where freshwater percolates to the ocean under the force of gravity. And is less dense than salt water. It floats on top of salty ocean water. And a good portion of our wastewater infrastructure is made up of on-site sewage disposal systems, or OSDS, many of which are cesspools. And these dispose of sewage and other types of wastewater underground, with the idea being that the material is filtered by natural processes before it reaches drinking water wells or the ocean. So cesspools, which are one of the main styles of OSDS, are described here. This is the state wastewater program website. So according to the State Department of Health, cesspools are little more than holes in the ground that discharge raw, untreated human waste. Cesspools can contaminate groundwater, drinking water sources, streams, and the ocean with disease-causing pathogens, algae-causing nutrients, and other harmful substances. Untreated wastewater from cesspools contains pathogens such as bacteria, protozoa, viruses that can cause gastroenteritis, hep, hep A, conjunctivitis, leptospirosis, salmonellosis, and cholera. And it's been estimated by researchers with the Department of Health that more than 110,000 active OSDS exist statewide in which 1,853 are cesspools located within 200 feet of a shoreline, which by themselves results in 1.7 million gallons of cesspool effluent or raw sewage to be rele released uh, within that 200 feet of the shoreline per day. So in 2016, there was a ban on the construction of new cesspools, but active cesspools remain in So here's a GIS map showing approximate OSDS locations on Oahu. You can see that a disturbing amount of these are located along the coastline. Okay, this is Oahu, here's Maui. 
and here's Kauai. So these resources um, have been produced for Molokai and the Big Island too. Uh, and these OSDS maps are hosted on the state GIS web portal. So sea level is rising. Um, these are measurements from the Honolulu tide gauge that show it rising steadily over the course of a century. This rate is expected to accelerate, which will exacerbate problems related to OSDS. The fourth national climate assessment has assigned high confidence to sea level magnitudes reaching between 0.15 to 0.37 meters by 2050 and between 0.3 and 1.3 meters by 2100. However, uh, emerging science on Antarctica suggests that it's physically possible that sea level may exceed 2.5 meters by 2100 under high emission scenarios. So at this point, coastal hazards, which are exacerbated by sea level rise, have begun to impact cesspools and other types of OSDS. Main coastal hazards impacting these are erosion and groundwater inundation. So these are pictures that my colleagues and uh, myself have taken over the years of OSDS located precariously close to the shoreline. So there's an arbitrary 50 foot setback required for installation of septic tanks. Um, if closer to the shoreline than that, the project requires a variance in which more sophisticated OSDS systems are required that provide a higher level of treatment. But note that even the um, sophisticated systems still require leach fields. So besides being arbitrary, there are two problems with relying on this 50 foot setback to make sure wastewater doesn't contaminate the shoreline. And one is kind of evident here that the distance between the shoreline and OSDS decreases as, as the shoreline moves landward by the process of erosion, such that eventually these systems can end up very near to the shoreline, or as you see here, they can end up directly on the shoreline, on the public beach. And then the second issue is that the distance between the uh, being measured when authorizing installation of OSDS, even of newly permitted OSDS, it's not necessarily being measured from the actual shoreline. It's being measured from a tax map key boundary. So it's common practice for planning departments to require surveyors to certify the shoreline location to establish setback before major changes are made on a property like building a house or installing a pool to make sure that the installation doesn't interfere with coastal processes. But uh, it seems that authorization for installation of OSDS might not follow that same procedure. So here's an example of a project that took place up at Pupukea. And this was last month where a cesspool was replaced with a septic tank and le leach field as part of house relocation, which actually represents somewhat of an example of managed retreat. It's one of the first cases that we've kind of seen. So that's good. But as part of cesspool closures, these systems are filled with cement. And it's hard to see on this. Um, on the survey map, but uh, surveyors have mapped the distance between that new leach field here and that TMK map boundary as about 69 feet shown here by my cursor. So that's more than the 50 foot setback, so that's good. So here's a close up of what they did. So here's the cesspool that was cleaned, pumped, and filled with cement. And then they installed the septic tank here and leach field. Okay, so the hot in that diagram is in this picture. Okay, so this was a swell event that took place last month. So that house is right here. So that leach field is a lot closer to the actual shoreline, which I marked in blue, what's shown on the plans. 
So it's actually a lot less than that, foot, that arbitrary 50 foot setback. Further, if you take a look at how erosion is projected to impact the site, according to the state sea level rise viewer, it's evident that the leach field and septic tank, in addition to the relocated house, will be directly impacted by erosion with a, as little as a half foot to 1.1 foot of sea level rise. That's this yellow line and the orange line, respectively. So you can see here. There's a half a foot and there's 1.1 feet of sea level rise. That's the erosion that's projected according to the state sea level rise viewer and report. So that gets back to the first issue that the shoreline in most places is moving landward, leaving these systems destined to be impacted by coastal hazards and in turn will impact coastal resources. So you might say to yourself that it's just one property um, but the reality is that a lot of these rural locations are not served by municipal sewage treatment. And so the issue you see here is one that ex exists along a very extensive length of shoreline. In addition, um, a lot of this coastal land has been heavily densified due to subdivision of um, this high value coastal property. So the other issue I wanted to hit on is uh, groundwater inundation. So in very low lying places, groundwater is really shallow. It's near to the surface of the ground such that you can dig a hole and find it within several feet or even a couple of feet of the ground surface. And groundwater goes up and down with the tides, anomalous sea levels, rainfall events, et cetera. And these photos show archeological and construction excavation sites in uh, Western Waikiki. That shows that groundwater is very near to the ground surface such that you can really envision issues that we'll be up against as sea level continues to rise. Basically, we're gonna have flooding coming up through the surface of the ground, which will flood underground assets and infrastructure even before that flood water reaches the surface of the ground. At sea level, groundwater will be lifted and it'll start forming these inland urban wetlands up here. And it's already causing damage to underground infrastructure in Honolulu. This is a basement um, located at Honolulu Police Station on Baratania. It's about a half a mile from the coastline. So just as a side note, sea level rise related flooding will not be and is not currently limited directly adjacent to the shoreline. So as part of my doctoral research, I mapped areas of future groundwater inundation by simulating water table elevations, considering present sea level and incremental increases in sea level, in addition to tidal influence. And by comparing uh, those water table elevations with ground elevation data here, I was able to make maps showing locations of expected groundwater inundation and areas with extremely narrow distances between the ground and groundwater, which is known as unsaturated space or sewage treatment space. And I compared those results to GS, DS, GIS data, in which we look mainly at cesspools. So the triangles show where active cesspools likely exist. And the Department of Health considers cesspools effective when they have 15 feet or more space between the ground and groundwater, because it's assumed that treatment has occurred by filtrate, filtration through the soil. And blue triangles show cesspool locations that currently have that 15 feet. And yellow triangles show cesspools that don't meet that criteria, either because there's not enough unsaturated space between Hi. ground and the base of the cesspool. Is this an How's it going? 
Can you guys hear me still? Yes, thank you. Okay. So, okay, so yellow triangles show cesspools that, that are either inundated, um, they either don't have enough infatuated space or the groundwater is, has inundated the actual cesspool itself. And then red triangles show where cesspools have been fully inundated from top to bottom and are considered to be releasing that wastewater to the ground surface where people are walking around. So on this map, again, these are current conditions. Um, in Honolulu, very close to 90% of the cesspools in our study or the area that we looked at in the primary urban core are considered compromised according to our results. So here, next, I'll show simulations of sea level rise induced groundwater inundation and cesspool failure. So here we go. This is one foot of sea level rise. Note the change in color of um, the triangles showing cesspool inundation. Two feet, three feet, four feet, and five feet. So going forward in time, you can see cesspools going from compromised to fully flooded, where it'd be likely that contamination at the ground surface would occur. And again, areas in blue show where groundwater inundation is occurring above the ground surface. Yellow areas show where groundwater is very very shallow, about a, a foot below the ground, which highlights areas vulnerable to flooding during rainfall events and flooding of underground infrastructure like basements. So it's one thing to run models and simulate these issues, which highlight the potential for increased contamination. We go forward in time, uh, particularly in areas frequented by the public, but it's another to actually confirm it. And with that, I'll go ahead and toss it to my colleague, Tristan, Dr. Tristan McKenzie. Okay, so I wanted to um, thank you all for coming today and thank you, Michael, for the introduction and um, the invitation to speak today. Um, I'm gonna be talking today about a study that builds upon research that Shelley was talking about, but it's using field-based geochemical measurements to confirm tidally driven groundwater inundation of wastewater infrastructure in the Honolulu urban area. Um, and this work I'll be talking about today is collaborative with co-authors Shelley Habel and Henrietta Dulai. So I know Shelley brought up this figure before, but I want to emphasize now another aspect and that is Submarine Groundwater Discharge, or SGD. Um, this refers to groundwater that discharges to the coast. And SGD can be fresh to brackish to saline, depending on the regime it occurs in. Um, fresh or terrestrial SGD is primarily driven by the hydraulic gradient. So it tends to be greatest at high tide, or sorry, at low tide when the hydraulic gradient is maximized. Um, at, um, alternatively, saline SGD um, is uh, mostly the product of forces such as tidal pumping, wave setup, localized pressure gradients, and long-term ocean water fluctuations. But what's important about um, both of these and what's important about groundwater, which is a focus of my work, is that it connects the land to the ocean. Um, and this is potentially a problem when we have contaminants in route. So um, again, as Shelley mentioned, on-site sewage disposal systems, or OSDS, um, these are personal receptacles for household waste and sewage, um, can also be a major source of groundwater contamination, particularly in Hawaii, where we have a lot of them. Um, so uh, while OSDS are more common on other islands, there are still about 11,000 on Oahu. And so the figure here shows OSDS density for the island of Oahu. Um, areas where the OSDS density exceeds 40 units per square mile, this is where um, areas in orange or red even, where red indicates over 100 uh, OSDS units per square mile, um, present a high risk for groundwater contamination. Um, and these are, this, this is actually set out by the EPA. Um, what's worse is a lot of these are located right along the coast. Um, and even in urban areas such as Honolulu, um, both OSDS and uh, other wastewater infrastructure such as aging sewer lines present a risk to water quality. 
So this brings us now to an important question. How will sea level rise impact coastal wastewater infrastructure and water quality? Um, this isn't just an issue in Hawaii. Globally, there's a disproportionate development along the coast. About 40% of the population lives within 100 kilometers of the coast currently, and eight out of the 10 most populous cities are coastal. And to make this worse, both population density and population itself are increasing in coastal areas and are projected to further increase in the coming decades. Rising sea levels raise the water table, leading to groundwater inundation and then potentially negative impacts to water quality. One pathway for sea level rise to impact coastal wastewater infrastructure is through a direct routing, such as through the inundation of OSDS or fractured sewer lines. And the figure here illustrates this effect. We're under current sea levels. Uh, many coastal OSDS are compromised because they don't have a sufficient depth above the water table for uh, natural remediation to occur. Um, but as water, as sea level occurs um, and rises, um, then um, these coastal OSDS will become inundated through the rising water table and then uh, further compromise um, upstream or upslope OSDS. Um, the other, there's another pathway that I'll be talking about a little bit today um, for sea level rise to impact coastal wastewater infrastructure, and that's through uh, indirect means uh, such as the flooding of storm drains that flow to the coast. And this pathway becomes a vector for wastewater transport when there are either OSDS in the vicinity um, or compromised sewer lines. So the research I'm going to be talking about today was motivated by the fact that modeling based studies have shown groundwater inundation of wastewater infrastructure under future sea levels or even during uh, king tide levels occurring today. In Hawaii, development is um, concentrated along the coast, often at sea level, meaning any changes in sea level are direct threats to coastal infrastructure. So for instance, these photos are from uh, the industrial district of Mapunapuna near the airport. And this area experiences nuisance flooding uh, during spring tides or heavy rains. And this actually comes out through the storm drains itself. And one can only expect situations such as this to become exacerbated in the future with sea level rise. And just to highlight some additional instances of nuisance flooding from Honolulu, um, this is the parking lot at Almoana during a king tide. But I really want to emphasize these two pictures. These are both from Mapunapuna. And this is the same storm drain three minutes apart. So right here, the um, water level is just about to come to the surface of that manhole cover. And within three minutes, the whole street is flooded. So this is a very rapid occurrence. And this is uh, during a high tide um, during King Tide a couple summers ago. So um, this study investigates how sea level rise will impact wastewater infrastructure. Um, we did this in uh, looking at two pathways. The first was uh, through direct discharge to the coastal zone via SGD. And then the second was through storm drain backflow. Um, we focused in two low-lying areas, uh, predominantly uh, made of reclaimed land, uh, Mapunapuna, and then Waikiki. Waikiki was our primary site in, along the Alawai Canal uh, for studying the coastal route, and then Mapunapuna was our primary site for studying storm drains. Um, this, um, in part because of the narrow, unsaturated space in both of these areas, uh, previous studies by Habel et al. have demonstrated that 89% of OSDS were flooded um, during the 2017 king tides. So um, let's now look a bit into how we're going to uh, approach this from a geochemical standpoint. Uh, for this study, uh, we used geochemical tracers to study groundwater and wastewater discharge. Groundwater discharge was measured using radon. Radon is a naturally occurring radiogenic gas, um, and it's a well-established tracer for groundwater. Um, and then we couple these radon measurements with contaminants of emerging concern, otherwise known as CECs, as tracers for wastewater. Radon time series were conducted during spring tides to document groundwater discharge. And then we collected samples during low, mid, and high tide for CECs and nutrients to investigate this wastewater connection. And you can see kind of an example of our setup here in one of the storm drains. And briefly, I just want to say a little bit more about CECs. 
because um, I, I think they're really interesting and there's a lot of potential to uh, use them in future research. Uh, CECs include compounds such as pharmaceuticals, endocrine disrupting chemicals, industrial chemicals, pesticides, and other anthropogenically sourced compounds that are resistant to degradation in the environment. Um, they're considered environmentally persistent, generally in trace quantities and sourced from poor removal efficiencies in wastewater treatment plants, sewage leaks, industrial and agricultural rain runoff to name a few sources of them in the environment. Uh, even in trace quantities, CECs have been demonstrated to have negative impacts on the ecosystem. And for instance, even nanogram per liter quantities of endocrine disrupting chemicals such as birth control pills have been linked to increased intersexuality of invertebrates. While their degradation pathways differ in the environment, CECs can also be used for um, as tracers of anthropogenic pollution. And so the table here on the bottom of the slide highlights the difference um, or the behavior and degradation pathways that these are based off of chemical parameters for the compounds that I used in this research. But what I really want to highlight, or I want to highlight here that the um, while the behavior is quite different between these compounds, this is actually something that we can also use to our advantage um, in the context of tracing wastewater in the environment. Right, so uh, here are some uh, radon time series results for the Waikiki coastal sites. Uh, radon concentrations here are shown in this red line. We have this blue dashed line that indicates salinity. This is over time. These are all from low to high tide. And then these are by sampling site. And for the Waikiki sites, we did uh, both king tide and spring tide uh, studies. Um, what I really want to highlight here is that during the king tide, submarine groundwater discharge fluxes were up to 3.4 times greater compared to the spring tide for the coastal sites, demonstrating increased groundwater discharge and conductivity. Um, in Mapuna Puna, um, two out of three storm drain sites showed significant increase <coughs> in both radon and salinity at high tide, demonstrating a tidally influenced connection between groundwater and the storm drains. And just real quickly, in case you're confused, uh, we started at high tide for this site. And so this one is actually reversed from the other two. So this, these two sites, SD1 and SD2, um, both had this increase in salinity and increase in radon at high tide. And remember that this is these are storm drains. This is uh, the water inside the storm drain. So this is not. Um, the typical situation. Um, this, this third site, SD3, um, we observed an increase in salinity at high tide, but the radon was actually decreasing, um, just indicating that at least for the groundwater inundation story, it's a little bit different, um, but also worth noting that SD1 and SD2 are directly connected to one another, whereas SD3 has um, a little different connection. So now that we've established that there is this tidally driven groundwater connection, what's actually in the water? Um, I don't have time today to go into detail about everything shown on this figure, but what I really want to highlight here is that this is a highly dynamic system. So just a little uh, orientation into this figure because there's so much going on. Um, we have our Waikiki and Mapuna Puna sites. These are for the Waikiki sites, we have surface water versus groundwater and then storm drains versus coastal for um, Mapuna Puna. And then each of these um, is a study site and we have low, mid and high tide. So that's kind of how these figures are working. Um, so we're getting the variation over tide. And then um, what I really just want to emphasize here are the um, nitrogen concentrations, which are shown in the bar plot. So the um, green is nitrate and nitrate concentrations. The blue, we have uh, ammonium concentrations. And then in the yellow here, we have dissolved organic nitrogen concentrations. Um, and in most of these samples, the total nitrogen is split amongst those species. And in some cases, it's, it's nearly 50-50 dissolved organic nitrogen along with some other nitrogen species. And this is not favorable under steady state conditions. So this is a highly transient um, situation. Um, the other point I'm going to just uh, bring up here um, is that uh, over 94% of our samples had at least one detectable compound or CEC compound in it. Um, carbamazepine and caffeine were the most frequently detected. 
uh, ranging from 54 to 93 percent overall for a detection frequency. And then the fluoroquinolones, this is an antibiotic compound that's highly photodegradable, um, was only detected in the storm drains with a 16 percent overall detection frequency. So the presence of CECs and their fluctuation with tide then provides concrete evidence for tidally driven inundation of wastewater infrastructure. And so delving into this a bit further, I did a principal components analysis for the coastal samples. Uh, here, uh, these are all the same PCA, but they're color coded differently according to different groupings. And so here we have um, an A, groundwater versus surface water. B is low tide, mid tide versus high tide. Um, C, we have the king tide versus spring tide. And then in D, this is by sampling site. Um, but these groupings can really be broken down into reducing and oxidizing conditions, where reducing conditions are more prevalent when terrestrial forces, or in other words, um, when terrestrially driven groundwater uh, discharge is more prevalent, and that is the dominant control on the groundwater discharge. Um, and so now let's break this down again from the perspective of tidal height. So here we have uh, low versus high tide, and then these are CEC scores by study site. The CEC uh, scores are just a means to normalize the CEC compounds so that we can compare more easily between sites. And for the coastal Waikiki sites, CEC scores increased from low to high tide, um, illustrating an increased flux from wastewater infrastructure at high tide. The opposite uh, was actually observed for the storm drains in Lapuna Puna. And here we attribute this to a difference in the environment. So in Waikiki, as the groundwater level rises with the tide, there will be an increased connection and infiltration uh, between wastewater infrastructure and the groundwater, which then, subs which then afterwards will then discharge to the coast. In Mapuna Puna, though, you have this seawater intrusion through the storm drain network, which already has water in it. Um, and it's leading then to dilution of the sewage effluents from wastewater infrastructure. So that's why we're observing uh, differences in these trends. Um, and at higher water levels, this leaking sewage is increasingly connected to the storm drain network. Um, and in the case of Mapuna Puna, on a regular basis, this then overflows onto the sidewalks and the street, which is not great. Um, and during the 2017 uh, king tides, we actually have this case also um, occurring in Waikiki. So um, here's a conceptual model then of what's occurring. Um, I'm going to really kind of focus on this side comparing the low tide and high tide scenarios. So during low tide, fresh or terrestrially driven submarine groundwater discharge is the dominant groundwater um, input. So groundwater flow is Malka to Makai. And we have a, a more a greater prevalence of reduced species coming out into the um, coastal areas because of this terrestrially driven groundwater um, source. Um, during high tide, though, we actually um, have a difference in regime and saline uh, SGD actually becomes the dominant uh, method for groundwater. Um, so that means that the groundwater flow is actually coming uh, from the ocean. And we have an increase in then these oxidized species um, coming out from this oxygen influence of the oxygenated seawater. Um, also then at high tide, we get um, an inflow um, through the storm drain networks of seawater. Um, this also, um, this also uh, rising sea levels also increase the uh, groundwater level. And in some cases, um, and particularly in Mapuna Puna, then this water will then rise to the uh, street level. So while CECs were applied here as wastewater tracers, they also pose an environmental risk. And to assess environmental risk, we calculated risk quotients. This is based off of the predicted no effect concentration or PNEC for each compound. The PNEC is based off of the concentration of a specific compound that leads to the disruption of a biological function, such as reproduction or growth in an organism. So from there, a risk quotient is assigned based off of the observed CEC concentration relative to the PNEC. Risk quotients that exceed one indicate a high risk to the ecosystem. And for our samples, average risk quotients for surface water and storm drain samples were above one, demonstrating that even under current conditions, 
CECs are in concentrations that pose a high risk to the ecosystem. And in many cases, as shown in the table, um, any of these that are bolded, uh, these risk quotients greatly exceed one, even up to 26 for um, the fluoroquinolones at one of the storm drain sites. Um, so overall, um, we had risk quotients that um, were high risk in 62% of our samples for carbon mazepine and caffeine and 24% in the fluoroquinolones. And so this is important that not only is there potential for um, human inconvenience with nuisance flooding or, you know, potentially um, illness if you're surfing or whatever um, when this water is discharging, but it's also harming the ecosystem. And it should be an important consideration going forward. So in conclusion, here we provide field-based evidence for tidally driven groundwater inundation of wastewater infrastructure. This is already occurring today during spring tides and will worsen with increasing sea levels. Importantly, wastewater leakage and groundwater inundation lead to saturating conditions in the unsaturated zone, reducing the capacity for any natural bioremediation to occur. And in general, cesspools and coastal aquifers do not offer effective wastewater tr uh, treatment because of the porous geology, groundwater level, proximity to the coast. And this issue is only going to become exacerbated by sea level rise, population increase, and the unavailability of appropriate treatment technologies. Um, I want to quickly acknowledge um, those that helped with the um, field and lab work and um, thought processes behind uh, this work, and to also um, acknowledge all of the various sources of funding um, that helped this research happen. And I'll flip to Shelley's acknowledgments. Oh, thank you, Trista. Fantastic job. Um, yeah, I just want to thank uh, everyone who watched today and to all the amazing colleagues who've helped with these studies. Also, thank you to those who helped fund the research, including um, on my side, Honolulu Board of Water Supply, University of Hawaii Sea Grant, Pacific Islands Climate Science Center, and the HKL Castle Foundation. And with that, I guess we can go to questions. Thank you, Dr. McKenzie. Thank you, Dr. Hamel. Uh, we have some great questions. I'll start. I've been recording them in the beginning, so I'll, I'll just begin. The first question comes from Chris, and it says, why aren't cesspools closed and required to hook into the municipal uh, sewer treatment plant that is in immediate vicinity? Your slide of cesspools in the Honolulu Kali area uh, that is in reference to the Honolulu Kali area. Uh, that's a good question. I think we get that question a lot, um, but I think a lot of it comes down to the fact that it's expensive. The fact that a lot of folks, I think, in the primary urban core, they might not know what their system even is. Um, another one is for Waikiki specifically, um, that it's very um, difficult to dig without disturbing um, like EV, other cultural, um, other cultural remains um, and resources there. So yeah, I think, yeah, obviously, if there's sewer lines in place, um, there needs to be um, action towards getting uh, folks hooked up. But it's just a matter of, I, I think, um, really tracking where the cesspools are, what systems people are on, what kind of OSDS are located where. Thank you. Uh, next question comes from Crystal. And that says, how are cesspools cleaned before they are filled? You know, I don't know if you know, Trista, it's my best guess that they're pumped out um, as best as possible and then filled in with cement. Do you know, Michael? Yeah, that's, that's the best way. Trista, did you have anything to add? No, I, I, I wasn't sure, so great job, team. Okay, and Maya asks uh, another question. So are there any thresholds or recommendations 
for how much dry space there should be in storm drains. It seems like these storm drains are not functioning as intended. Is there a point where agencies that maintain the drain infrastructure might mark them as non-functional? Sure. That would be, yeah, I think that's an important step. It would require um, mapping very carefully the elevations of the invert elevations, the distance between the surface of the ground and the infrastructure, um, where that where that stuff is, because it's not down at a uniform uh, elevation or depth. And um, so it's possible with um, different types of sea level rise uh, simulations to kind of map out where storm drains are likely to fail. We kind of did a preliminary look at that um, in a paper I wrote with some colleagues. Uh, it just came out uh, this year, actually, or last year, 2020, um, that mapped where storm drain failure um, is likely happening now and will likely happen as sea level continues to rise. So I think improving those simulations would take um, just a very hard look at um, really getting accurate an accurate representation of the depth of that infrastructure. And, yeah. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I have, I have a question for Dr. McKenzie. For the CEC uh, monitoring, what type of um, protocol or our monitoring program could be set up to get uh, data over longer uh, spatial and temporal time scales so that you could compare, you know, are, are those DECs increasing in concentration and is there variability in uh, rainfall events or? Right, I, I'm, I, I've heard rumors of some automated sensors in development, um, but to me, the best way to do this would just be to go sample frequently and um, analyze them. Uh, there, there's kits now you can buy. You can do a lot of samples at once for a much more affordable price um, compared to like, you know, sending them off to a lab, which can be quite expensive. Um, but, you know, it's also worth noting that CECs are largely unregulated. And so even coming out with these results and saying, hey, we have, you know, X concentration of say caffeine in the water, there's no regulatory policy that current exists to for that to actually lead to change, I guess, would be the way to phrase it. Uh, next question comes from Sherry. How is the distance between the base of the cesspool and the surface of the groundwater measured? So that's based on state criteria. I think it's um, written in Hawaii administrative rules, uh, the distance that's required and construction considerations. And so um, we took that information and we assumed that it applied to every cesspool that we looked at, even though that is likely not the case. Um, but that, that's the best that we had at that point. But it would be great to get elevations of the actual basis of cesspools, but that would be a dirty job. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I think there's a TV show for that, right? Oh my God, yes. <laughs> so uh, we have another question, um, and I, I hope I don't mess up your name. Um, Lily Kala, did anyone be swimming in Waikiki or the Alawai Canal where the Alawai drains out to the ocean? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I, I will say that the Department of Health does regularly monitor many beaches, including Magic Island, for um, uh, bacterial counts that would make it unsafe for swimming. Um, but you know, like anywhere, it's, it's a function of circulation and how much is coming in or go, and going out, right? And so um, I guess I, I've been surfing over there. So if I still surf over there, that's probably <laughs> OK, at least. Um, but yeah, I, I, don't, I don't pretend to be able to make those kind of judgments. Yeah, rinse off afterwards, clean your ears. <laughs> That's what I would do. Don't go in, in brown water days. Nope. 
All right. Uh, Chris asks, does the county and state set a goal to close OSDS per year or decade? What is the priority determined for closing? And how are we doing? Um, uh, I can quickly answer that because this is you both of your presentations. Um, but currently, there, Chris, there is no set goal. We we have the 2050 deadline, uh, but there are folks that are working on in uh, upgrading those priority areas, and then hopefully figuring out a mechanism to say this priority area should go first. And so we're we're trying to use uh, more science-based information and then studies to back up the either a simulation or um, a layer on the GIS map to try to say, okay, this area is more risky and they should go first. And that's still an ongoing problem. Uh, next question. There's a couple that just came through in the chat. So if cesspools were the proper distance from the ocean at depth, would the natural filtering of wastewater be an effective treatment? I would say no, it just wouldn't be as bad. So cesspools are a really antiquated um, wastewater technology. Um, currently, in Hawaii, you, if you have a cesspool, you do have to upgrade it to a septic tank by 2050. Um, and an, on another note, in Hawaii, even if you're not located near the coast um, or near water resources, um, our geology, our underlying geology is quite porous. And so um, it's really not, you can't have, I guess the water, will, the groundwater travels quite quickly here. So um, the argument about sufficient uh, remediation is, um, well, I, I, don't, I don't think you can get that, that here, not, not with our porous um, lithology. And just to note that the septic tank is the bare minimum that you would have to. So depending on the site conditions, if you're very close to the coast or you're in one of those areas that does have recorded um, low depth of groundwater, you know, a more advanced uh, aerobic treatment unit uh, can be used and there's other technologies. Generation toilets are being looked at um, and you could even use a septic tank with say uh, a, uh, uh, a leach field that um, has, oh, I'm, I'm blanking, um, evapotranspirative evapor properties. So uh, we have a couple more questions. I'll go through those. Should we maybe think about rerouting the storm water to the wastewater treatment plant? I have some thoughts on that. I, if we did that, I don't think our, our um, treatment systems have the capacity to treat that much water. And um, that's actually evident by, um, like during rainfall events, um, the groundwater, the, the rain comes down, the groundwater comes up to the point that it enters the cracks in the pipes and it um, sends a huge amount of water to be treated at the treatment centers. And that's what leads to them having to release wastewater um, just because they just don't have the capacity to store it. So I think um, the same thing would happen if you, um, sent stormwater to uh, the treatment plants. Um, in a perfect world, that would be great. Um, this wastewater probably should be treated because it, it likely has contaminants in it, but that might not be the way to do it in this imperfect world. Thanks. Um, I'm going to pass one to Dr. McKenzie. What range of concentrations of CECs were found in the water and what method was used for analysis? Sure. So we, um, CECs generally range from tens to hundreds of nanograms per liter. Um, concentrations tended to be a little higher for caffeine uh, compared to carbamazepine. And um, we analyzed all of these using those kits I was talking about. Um, we have a system uh, that uses uh, calorimetry 
um, colorimetric methods uh, made by Abraxas. And we've actually sent some samples also to the USGS where they use um, mass spec to um, confirm that we're getting the same concentrations. And we have really good agreement between um, our results and theirs. Thank you. There's another question dealing with the sewer lines. Could you talk about the role of compromised sewer lines contributing to coastal pollution? If the sewer mains are already insufficient, there would seem to be little point in disabling cesspools and connecting to sewer mains. Sure, so um, I should specify first that, um, that the method used um, doesn't really allow us to differentiate between pollution source from cesspools or uh, sewers. So we can only say yes, wastewater, no wastewater, right? And um, the other aspect is that we don't know um, it, from the sewer perspective, um, there's the sewer mains and there's also the sewer laterals. And it's important to know that the laterals are actually privately owned. Um, so that's a it becomes a much bigger problem to uh, manage and maintain. But that being said, the current EPA estimates, I want to say, are at least 20% of sewers in the US have some sort of defect or fracture. Um, and unfortunately, these leaks are really difficult to detect. Um, they often go on for a while before um, it's um, noticed. So um, in either case, um, disabling uh, cesspools should be a priority because you, you know, if you think about just even a surface area aspect, um, you know, the sewer line is, um, I, I guess from cesspools, you don't have any kind of impeded um, discharge, right? So it just, it just comes out. And so, and these can be directly inundated as well. Um, so um, in either case, I think the cesspool should definitely be a priority, um, but ideally we would address all of these. A perfect world, right? Yeah. What steps are, what are the first steps to take to work towards getting an area with known cesspools along the shoreline to be prioritized for conversion to upgraded systems? You want to take that one, Michael? I think you know that one than we do. Um, I, I, you know, um, that might be lengthy. I want to save the questions for you, but I will reach out to Mia and try to answer that. Or I'll read my email. You have a quick answer? Just a real quickie? Uh, well, I guess the first steps would be to be able to like you were mentioning, track that shoreline and relay that back to planning offices and the state's um, um, wastewater DOH brand so that we can eliminate that, you know, where, where the property map was showing that there's this property there, what's really not. So that would be, you know, more uh, on the ground sort of field truthing, I think would be the first step. And we'll do one more quick one. So how does Hawaii's carbamazepine concentrations compare to other jurisdictions? Very similar um, in terms of the range and um, especially as compared to urban centers. Um, I did a study in Sydney, Australia, and really we had very, very similar concentrations coming out um, from that same location. Um, so yeah, we're we're hitting the mark, I guess, for, for other municipalities. Maybe some comfort in that. Well, I just want to reiterate my huge thanks to Dr. McKenzie, Dr. Habel, uh, everyone at WRC and all the uh, participants who joined us today. Uh, we have a great semester of other presenters. So please check that out on our website and um, if you have any further questions, there is an email. Um, feel free to email me. Um, and Tom, do you have anything to close us out with? Yeah, thank you, Michael. Uh, thanks everybody for attending. We had record attendance today, well over 100 for most of the session. So I wanna thank the two speakers, uh, Shelly and Trista, outstanding job and really important work. Uh, it was great to get an update on all that work. So thank you very much.